friends, welcome back. So, today we're going to continue our introduction to the last chapter of this class, which starts now and runs until May. What we're going to be talking about for the next few weeks are algorithms and data structures. And as I've said, this is, at least to me, and I hope to you by the time we're done, by far the most exciting, the most um, impactful material that we'll cover this semester. So we set you up with a strong foundation. You know how to write some imperative code. You know how to use objects. And now what we're going to do is leverage those skills going forward to build some cool things, to talk about how long things take to run, to talk about some classic algorithms for solving certain types of problems, we'll learn some new tools when it comes to how we write programs, including a technique called recursive programming, which we'll get to after break. So, but today what we're going to do is we're going to go back and you know, make another pass through our discussion of algorithm runtime, because this is a topic that is going to inform how we analyze the algorithms and data structures that we build from here on out. So what we're going to be doing repeatedly throughout the rest of the class is we'll create a new data structure or we'll implement a new algorithm, and then we'll talk about how it performs. And to do that, we need some common language. So that's where we are today. So as a reminder, um, algorithms are, algorithms consist of a series of steps that I take to follow a problem, to solve a problem. An algorithm does not consist of computer code. Computer code implements an algorithm in a way that's appropriate to a particular programming language or environment. So I can have the same algorithm implemented in Java, Python, Go, Haskell, whatever. And those implementations may be different. They frequently are because you want to respond to the unique features of the particular language that you're using, but they may implement the same algorithm, so the same set of steps for solving the problem. As computer scientists, you know, we write algorithms that perform simple calculations, store the results, repeat uh, that process, and make simple decisions. Those are our building blocks. And this takes us back to the first unit of the class where we were talking about imperative programming. We're also talking about data structure. And again, these are two highly complementary topics. We talk about algorithms um, that we can run on certain data structures, and we talk about data structures that we use to support certain types of algorithms. So, Today, we're going to introduce you to this idea of a list. A list is a generalization of an array. It's a great starting point for us because it's fairly simple. It's similar to an array, which you guys are already familiar with. But we can talk about two different ways to implement a linked list and the t uh, to implement a list, excuse me, and the trade-offs between them. So it's a single data structure. We'll actually use Java interfaces as well, so this is a cool place to carry forward some of the ideas that we uh, introduced when we talked about object-oriented programming. We'll use Java interfaces to, you know, represent what it means for an object to be a list, and then we'll talk about two different ways to implement the same interface that to the user of the interface look equivalent, but are quite different under the hood. And the reason that we want to support multiple different ways of implementing the same list interface, of creating the same data structure, is because they perform differently when used as part of an algorithm. So if your algorithm has certain properties, you want to store the data in what's called a linked list. If your algorithm has other properties, it is probably going to be faster if you store the data in something called an array list. So same data structure, different trade-offs. We'll talk about those trade-offs using big O notation, which we'll review again today. So again, this is just a, a wonderful, you know, part of the semester, because now everything that we've learned is starting to come together, right? We're going to do some imperative programming. We'll see how some of the object-oriented concepts that seem really abstract when we were talking about them at the, at the beginning now come into play. So this is, this is fun stuff. When we build data structures in Java, we, we do that typically by designing classes that um, implement a particular data structure. Those classes use the same types of things that we've talked about in the past. So we use primitive types or objects to store data itself. And then um, we can make use of existing built-in Java data structures like arrays. We'll do that in one of our list implementations. And we use references frequently to establish relationships between data. So a lot of times we talk about data structures, we talk about structuring data. How do we structure data? We structure data by establishing relationships between different pieces of data, we do that in Java using references. So a piece of data is encapsulated in a class that holds a reference to another piece of data. And it'll become particularly important when we talk about both linked lists, which we'll get to after, I think on Friday, um, 
or after break, and then trees. Okay. So, so again, I, I really want to drive this point home that these two ideas are really highly complementary. So whenever we talk about algorithms, think about what data structures are required to run this algorithm. Whenever we talk about data structure implementations, we're going to think about the impact that the design choices we make when we implement a data structure have on the algorithms that are going to use it. So, you know, again, and, and lists are a great place to start because these two ways to implement a list that look equivalent to the user can end up having big performance implications depending on what algorithm the user is using the list as a part. Right? So, you know, we'll implement algorithms to use specific features of data structures, particularly true when we talk about trees. Um, and then we'll implement data structures as part of a way to support certain types of algorithms. So most data structures don't, ex you know, data structures don't exist for no reason. They exist because I can then run an algorithm on them. So if this starts to feel a little abstract and you're like, why are we talking about these random tree data structures, remind yourself that the tree exists because there's cool algorithms that we can run on it that are more efficient or more possible because of the different type of structure that a particular data structure brings to the data. And again, this will give us lots of practice to continue to write imperative code and to exercise some of our object-oriented concepts as well. All right. Great. So last time we, we introduced this idea of different categories for analyzing algorithms. What we want really here is a common language. We want to be able to classify an algorithm or a particular operation on a data structure um, in a way that allows us to compare it with other things. And this is something that as a computer scientist, particularly as you go on and take 225 and other courses, you're going to become very conversant at. This is something that you will be asked in an interview. The interviewer will say, you know, inserting an item into a heap, what's the runtime of that operation? And, and you, that's one of those things that you should know. You know, what's the best case runtime of a sorting algorithm? Again, something else that you should know. What's the worst case runtime of quicksort? Something else that you should know. How do you answer those questions, though? Because it depends on the size of the array that I'm sorting. It might depend on the size of the data structure, some features of the input. We answer those questions using these complexity classes that we're going to talk about. Um, you know, this is our common language for describing how long algorithms take in, as a function of some feature of their inputs. And this is, this is a really powerful idea because it allows us to compare two ways of doing things in a way that's very general. It's not tied to a specific problem, but it emphasizes some general feature of that algorithm or data structure. Normally, when we perform these kind of analyses, one way to simplify our analysis to, is to think about what happens as the inputs to the algorithm get very large. So, you know, as the size of the, as the number of elements that I want to sort goes to infinity, how long does a sorting algorithm take to run? As a function of its inputs. Same thing with a list. As the size of the list gets really big, how long does a particular operation take? This is, um, you know, this is partly because we want to understand what happens when things get really big. You know, your sorting algorithm might have to handle a list of elements or a number of elements that's much larger than you, you would use when you test it, so you want to understand that. It's also because thinking about the limit behavior. So some of you took math before, you might have talked about asymptotic behavior of a particular function. Um, this is similar. It also allows us to ignore certain features of the algorithm that end up not being important once it's being run on really, really large inputs. So for example, there's always some sort, you know, setup I have to do, a few local variables that have to get initialized, whatever. When we talk about what happens when things get really big, we can just ignore those, because those are constant time uh, operations, and as the problem gets really big, they contribute less and less and less to the runtime of the algorithm. And so essentially we ignore them. Um, we'll also frequently think when we analyze algorithms about what are the best, what's the best case runtime? What's the best thing that can happen for that particular algorithm? What's the worst case? Algorithms that have a big spread in the best and worst case runtime or data structures that have a big spread when performing certain operations require care when you use them. 
Because it's possible, for example, that you know, the couple of tests that you wrote to make sure that your code is fast enough to run in production are exercising best case inputs, not worst case. If there's a huge difference between the best and the worst case, then you better be pretty sure that when you actually run this for real, for a client or on somebody's device, that you don't get worst case behavior. If the two are the same, then you can be very confident about what's happening. We'll see cases where the best and the worst case are the same. That's an algorithm about which we can have a lot of confidence. That's a nice feature on some level. It's still not great if it's slow, then slower than other, another better algorithm, but when those two, when best and worst case are the same, it makes it easier to reason about what's gonna happen because the, um, the runtime of the algorithm given a specific input is less tied to some feature of that input. But we're also gonna talk about algorithms where this is not the case where the best case can be really good, the worst case can be quite bad. Then we'll also, tr also try to reason about the average case performance. This is very, very hard to do because average, almost by definition, means over some set of inputs. The inputs that are provided to an algorithm are frequently the result of some feature of the problem that the algorithm is part of solving, right? So, you know, it, it average case a lot of times for a particular uh, algorithm it depends on how it's being used. Um, what are the inputs like? And then, always we talk about, when we classify algorithms, the N in our um, big O notation is related to some feature of the algorithm's inputs. And that feature varies from problem to problem. So one of the first things we do when we try to apply big O notation to a problem is we'll say, what is N? What feature of the problem is going to drive the performance? It's not always the same. Um, sometimes algorithms have multiple inputs, one of them has no effect on the performance, and the other one does. Imagine looking for a particular value in an array, which is something you guys were working on as a homework problem for the last two days. That, the runtime of that algorithm has no dependence on the element that I'm looking for, but has a strong dependence on how many items I have to look through. So one of the inputs doesn't contribute to n at all, and the other one Define, a feature of the other input is what really defines n, right? So this is the first thing we'll do is we'll say what feature of the problem is going to cause different runtime performance. All right, so last time we introduced this, and again, we're gonna go through this more slowly and give you guys time to absorb it again. Um, so when we talk about algorithms, we're gonna use something called big O notation. Part of the reason for this is that this is designed to be an approximation. Right, again, this is one of the reasons we talk about limiting behavior. Um, we're interested in what happens um, in approximating what happens. This is not going to give you, you know, the exact answer. It's a category. So sometimes you might have an algorithm that, you know, grows a little bit faster than O log N or a little slower, but we'll talk about that as an O log N algorithm, for example, or an O N algorithm, right? This is an approximation. As you go on, you'll get to classes where you start to become more specific about this, right? Um, but for now, we're keeping it simple uh, because to some degree, even this very simple categorization is extremely powerful. And the reason it's extremely powerful is it allows you to distinguish between algorithms whose runtime performance grows very gently as their inputs get larger. So this is a graph showing N on the x-axis and the runtime performance of algorithms in various classes, in various big O categories. So if you have an O-N algorithm, which is the green line here, that grows linearly with the size of the problem. So if you double the size of the problem, you expect the algorithm to take about twice as long. O-N factorial, on the other hand, grows incredibly quickly in the size of the problem. So if you double the size of the problem, it depends on where you are, but you can see that, you know, if I go from five to 10, five is, seems like it's maybe on this graph, who knows where 10 is, right? 10 is somewhere off in outer space. You know, it's through the roof, it's up in the place where they keep the curtains here. So that, you know, that, those two, if, if you have a problem and you accidentally implement an O n factorial algorithm, when all you needed was an O N algorithm, you're gonna notice. It's gonna be really slow. 
The other thing to, to warn you about, and again, we talked about this last time, but this is worth repeating, is that down here, when the problem is small, nothing is particularly bad. When you solve small problems, things run fast. And that's particularly true given how fast computers are today. So you can very easy de easily deceive yourself into thinking, oh, my algorithm's fine, because I ran the test cases and they passed within the timeout I set, right? Then, you know, your code gets deployed into production and the problem gets a little bit bigger, and if you've chosen an algorithm that's on one of these roller coaster rides, the, the whole program may crash. It's so slow, right? Whereas if you choose something that's out here that's growing more gently, you'll probably be fine. So there's a really, you know, there's a really important distinction. You know, we're not talking about very many categories. I mean, there's like seven lines on this graph, one of them that you can't see because it's down here hugging the x-axis. But choosing an algorithm that falls into this category versus one of these categories, or even this category versus this category, ends up having a huge impact on performance, even once the problem gets slightly bigger than the ones that you're likely to use when you test them. All right, questions about this before we go through some of the categories, and we'll look at some features of code that tends to give rise to these type of runtimes. Questions here before we go on. Okay, so let's, let's go through the list again. We started this last time, but again, this bears repeating. A one, so, so we're gonna do two things now. We're gonna talk about the complexity class, and then we're gonna talk about features of code that will allow you to identify, or at least guess, get a starting point for, given a snippet of code, what's the runtime of that snippet of code? We're not gonna talk about what the algorithm that code is is actually trying to solve. We're just gonna look at, because you, you don't actually have to know. I can give you an unlabeled piece of code, and you're not exactly sure what it's doing, but if you know how to spot some of the features of these complexity classes, you can at least estimate some things about its performance. Okay, so, O1, Con this is sometimes referred to as constant time. And the constant can be arbitrarily large, right? You might have an algorithm that takes one second to run if you give it one input. And it takes one second to run if you give it 1,000 inputs. And it takes one second to run if you give it 10 billion inputs. That's a constant time algorithm. It may feel slow when you give it one input. You're like, why is this taking so long, right? But, that's, but it's still constant time. The constant here doesn't have to be small. It frequently is small, but as long as the algorithm's performance doesn't depend at all on its inputs, we have something that's constant time. Things that are constant time in Java include most of the single type of operations that we've seen when we've been writing imperative code. So for example, Accessing an element in an array, like we're doing on line two, constant time operation. Uh, taking a reference and calling a, a method on it. Following the reference is a constant time operation. The method might take longer to run, depending on what it's doing. Assigning a value to a variable, constant time operation. Right? This is, now, now one of the other things that you want to start to be able to do when you think about analyzing algorithms is you want to think about what, what makes sense. What's the best that you could possibly do? Because that allows you to you know, avoid traps or cases where you're going to make you know, uh, poor assumptions about your algorithm. So, so let's talk about finding the maximum value in an array. Let's say that someone came to you and said, I have a constant time algorithm for finding the maximum value in an array. What would you say to that person? It sounds great, right? It's pretty exciting. What's the problem with that? A constant time algorithm for finding the maximum value of an array that contains an arbitrary number of elements and they're not organized in any particular way. You guys believe that? Is that an algorithm that you're gonna try to use as part of your next project? Yeah. Well, okay, so arrays can vary in size, right? But what doesn't make sense about this algorithm? 
constant time algorithm for finding the maximum value in an array. Yeah. Why? Well, okay, so you're onto something. We think that it should vary with the size of the array, but why? Right? What is a, what is a algorithm that computes the minimum probably have to do? Again, you can't make any assumptions about what's in the array. There are constant time algorithms for computing the minimum of an array if the array is sorted. That's easy. Right? But if the array is unsorted, you have no idea what's in it, why can't, why does it not make sense to have a constant time algorithm? Why does this feel like snake oil? Yeah. Yeah, I have to look at every value in the array, right? If there's some values in the array that I don't look at, then I'm not sure I found the maximum or the minimum because I haven't seen all of them. So any algorithm that has to examine every element in the array, what's the best case runtime for that algorithm? if the array has n elements. Yeah. O n. Yeah, so I, if I have to look at every element in the array, I can't, n I can never do better than O n. Because I, because accessing elements in the array is constant time, and I have to access n of them. If the array gets bigger, I have to look at more elements. If it gets smaller, I get to look at fewer elements. But there's no way to write a constant time algorithm that examines every element in the array that requirement is always going to introduce a dependence on how many elements are in the array. Now, we're going to look at algorithms that operate on arrays that have slower than O-N performance, so that's okay. Some algorithms that operate on arrays have O-N squared, some have O-N log N. Those are slower than O-N. But O-N is the best I can do if I have to look at every element in an array or a list. All right, so again, developing some intuition about you know, what features of the problem lead to certain uh, performance categories is also something that we're going to try to help you do over the next few weeks. Okay. So, let's talk about ON. So, I went, O1 is fantastic. Now I went to ON. We're still not, this is still not too bad. We're going, we're going to get slower and slower here. So now I have some dependence on N, where N is some feature of the problem. Hints that you have an O-N algorithm include a loop. Where is N in this loop? It's hard to see, actually, in this one, because I use the enhanced for loop. But if I have a for loop, where can you find N? Yeah. Yeah, it's, 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 the, it's, the, it's the limit, it's the condition in the array. So if I wrote this for loop without the enhanced for loop syntax, I would say for int i is equal to zero, i is less than my array dot length, i plus plus. So what's n? My array dot length. That for loop is going to execute that many times. In this case, I'm using the enhanced for loop, so I don't have to use an index variable, but I still know that this is going to execute n times. What could complicate this analysis? So this is nice. In this particular case, this is a sum. So for sum, I really do have to touch every single element in the array. What could happen inside my loop that might make me need to think a little harder about things? Yeah, right here. Okay, I might have some conditionals in the loop, right? A conditional, maybe I have a conditional that does more work than, than another conditional, but what else? Will the for loop always execute the number of times indicated in the declaration? What could cause it, what could cause that to not be true? Yeah. Yeah, so I might have some work that I do in, in the loop that, that doesn't, that depends on where I am in the array and gets larger and larger, right? I'm thinking of something simpler, yeah. Break. If I break out of the loop at some point, 
then it's not gonna execute n times anymore. It's gonna run something smaller than n. So that's a, that's a thing to look at when you're looking at loops. If you see a loop without a break statement, then you know how many times it's gonna execute. If that loop has a break statement somewhere inside of it, you know, again, usually we, I shouldn't say usually, we always put a break statement inside an if um, statement, because if you don't, you don't have a loop. You just have something that executes once. Um, if I see a break somewhere in my loop, then I have to think a little bit more about what happens, right? But if I see a simple loop with no break statements inside of it like this one, I know that's gonna execute n times, where n in this case is the length of the array. Okay, so now, you know, we're here, right? This, we're, we're talking about algorithms that, that have this, this curve. If I take the sum of a thousand elements using this algorithm, it's gonna take some amount of time. If I double the size of the array, it'll take about twice as long. If I triple the size of the array, it'll take about three times as long. It's dependent, so n in this problem is the length of the array. And the category that this array sum algorithm falls into is O n, which makes sense. It has to touch every element of the array once to include it as part of the sum. All right, so again, what about this, what about this example? So now I've, I've, um, I've tossed a little bit of, a little more complexity into this. Okay, so now I have a break statement. So, so now, now we get to exercise our complexity analysis muscle a little bit more. So what's the, what, what is this doing, first of all? This might appear on a quiz, say kind of like, what does this function seem to be doing? Yeah. It's looking, yeah, it's looking for a value, right? And I should probably set some variable in here or something like that, but I don't, so that's okay. Um, but I have some variable called looking for that I don't see declared in here, but must be declared somewhere. Um, and as soon as I find that value, I break out of the loop. So now this gets a little bit more interesting, right? And now we can talk about best case, worst case, and average case performance. Best case performance for this algorithm. What is the best thing that can happen? In which, the, 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 the scenario in which case this will run the fastest. Yeah. Yeah, if, if it turns out that the value that I'm looking for is in the array and is in the first position, then the loop will execute once. I enter the loop, array value gets the first value from my array, array value is equal to the value that I'm looking for, and I break. So in that case, it executes once, okay? What's the worst case performance for this algorithm? Yeah, David. Well, it's either the last element or not in the array. Yeah, so there's two, there, there's two ways to think about the worst case. One worst case is it's the last element. So the best case, it's the first element. Worst case, it's the last element in the array, or the array doesn't contain that element. Should fix the slides here. What about, what about on average? This gets tricky. Average case performance, yeah. Yeah, so okay, so, so let's assume that the value we're looking for is in the array somewhere. Let's assume that you know that. Then what is the average case performance? Yeah. Oh, n over two, right? So if I know, this is important, if I know that looking for is in the array, then sometimes it's at the beginning, sometimes it's at the end. If I run this algorithm a bunch of times, what you're gonna see is that the average amount of time I need to look for it is n steps over two. But, as the person over here pointed out, if I don't know whether the element is in the array, then I'm really not sure how long this is, this is going to run. So for example, if every time I look for a value it's not in the array, then the average time runtime is O n, right? Every time I look for a value that's not in the array, I get O n. Every time I look for a value that is in the array, I get O n squared, uh, sorry, O n over two, and so but the average case performance sort of depends on how likely it is that this value is in the array. Now, one thing that we, we do when we talk about these complexity classes is we simplify. Again, we're keeping it simple here. 
on over two to us, on. Just drop, drop the, the, the fraction. O 2n, on. O 10n, on. On over four, on. These all have a linear relationship with n, even if they have some, you know, factor that we're throwing in there, right? We're gonna ignore that for our purposes, right? We won't talk about O 2n or O n over two, we'll talk about away. Now, if, if you're out there in the real world and you can make your algorithm twice as fast, I would do that, right? You know, if, if somebody says, oh, hey, I've got this fixed to your code that increases the speed by a factor of two, don't be like, well, it's still O-N, right? Like, who cares, you know? Say, thank you, right? Because that, it, it still matters, right? Like, if your algorithm takes five minutes to run and suddenly it takes two and a half minutes to run, people will notice that, right? That, that, that's a big change. Okay, so let's, let's talk about our next category, O-N squared. So now, eh, where's my graph, right? Uh, now things are starting to get slower. Now we're seeing a super linear relationship between the size of the problem and how long it's going to take. So if we double the size of the problem, O-N squared takes four times as long. If we, multi if we make the problem 10 times larger, an O-N squared algorithm takes 100 times as long. One of the reasons that this is dangerous is because if you practice with small problems and then suddenly make them bigger when you're solving real problems as part of your real program, this slows down a lot and it can cause your program to behave quite differently. Here's a telltale sign that you might be dealing with something that's O-N squared. Two loops nested inside of each other. So every time this outer loop executes, the inner loop is also going to execute. So if the outer loop executes n times and the inner loop is O n, then I have O n squared. If I have triply nested loops, then I have O n cubed, potentially. Now again, it depends on what happens inside the loops. So one of the things that's happening in this example is that if I find a case, right, this, this algorithm is doing something, I think we've already asked you about this on, on one of the, uh, well, it's, it's determining whether or not a list is sorted. Let me point out one thing. This is a really bad way to determine how a list is sorted, okay? Don't do this. This is an O-N squared algorithm for solving a problem for which there's an O-N solution. It's here just for fun. So I'm going through the array, and essentially I'm looking for a case where two of the items are out of order. If I find that case, I return false. Now that return statement means that I have to think a little bit more about what happens with these loops because the outer loop is not always gonna execute n times and the inner loop is not always gonna execute n times. If ever I get to this return statement, I exit immediately. And so it's possible that, um, so again, let's go through our, we can go through our algorithm analysis on this again, right? But, but in cases where I have to go through an array and compare its every value in the array to every other value, now I'm talking about something that's probably O n squared. For every element in the array, I have n, n minus one, items of work to do, okay? There, you're, you're starting to talk about something that's O n squared. And you can identify it in this case, in the worst case, by these nested loops, right? So what's the best case runtime for this algorithm? So now we're gonna do our analysis again. Well, first of all, what's n? What defines n in this problem? In this case, I've only got one input to my algorithm, right? My function takes one parameter, parameter is an array, but what is n? If I asked you this on question, what, what's, the, what's the feature of the problem that's gonna define how we talk about how long things take? Yeah. The length of the array, yeah. So I have an array, I see both of my loops here are bounded by array.length. So in, in, if, if I don't hit this return statement, my outer loop is gonna execute array.length times, my inner loop is gonna execute array.length times every time the outer loop executes. And so this check in here, this is constant time, this check is gonna execute n squared times. But that's the worst case. What's the best case? Best case runtime. 
Well, and the array is not just unsorted, but it's unsorted in the first position. So imagine I get into the first loop, i is zero. I get into the second loop, I start j is zero. Um, now, technically, this is never going to be true when j is equal to i, but imagine I go to the next element, now i is zero, j is one, and that, at that position, the array is unsorted. I haven't, I have, the first two elements are out of order. This is checking whether the array is sorted in ascending order. So if the first two elements are out of order, the outer loop executes once, the inner loop executes twice, and essentially I have a constant time algorithm. What's the worst case runtime of this algorithm, or the worst case input? Somebody who hasn't spoken up yet today. No, you did. Worst case runtime. Yeah. The entire array is sorted. Yeah. Either that or the unsorted element is at the very end. So if my unsorted element is at the end, at the very, very last element, or the array is sorted. So if the array is sorted, what happens? The outer loop executes n times. The inner loop, every time the outer loop executes, the inner loop executes n times. And I never enter this if statement that would cause me to return immediately because I never find two elements that are out of order. Average case for this, you know, I'm going to say O n squared, right? But again, it depends on the distribution of your inputs. If all of the inputs are sorted arrays, you're, you're going to get, definitely going to get O n squared. If all of the inputs have an unsorted element at the beginning, you're going to get um, constant time, essentially. But given arrays that are filled with random values, what we're going to end up with here is about O n squared. Okay, good. So now let's talk. Okay, so now, now we're here. Right, so this is O n squared. We skipped O n log n. We'll come back and talk about it in a minute. So we've talked about linear performance. We've talked about constant time, which is way down here. You can barely even see. And now we've talked about O n squared. There's two other important complexity classes that we do want to discuss, right? But I'm going to defer this conversation a little bit because these two complexity classes um, end up relying on features of problems that we haven't seen yet. When we start talking about recursion, particularly when we do that on trees, we'll talk about these. But O log n and O n log n frequently come up in problems that I can break down into smaller pieces and then assemble the pieces together to make a larger solution. Where those are on the graph, so O log n is fantastic. O log n is this red line down here. It grows very slowly in the size of the input. Um, o n log n is in between O n squared and O n. All right. So here's why this matters, right? I'll just go back and emphasize this, and, and we'll go back and look at this on the graph. So it matters because the algorithm you choose frequently can transition you between these complexity categories. If you choose a dumb algorithm to solve a problem, what does it mean for an algorithm to be dumb? The algorithm is not dumb, right? The algorithm is what it is, right? The algorithm's like, look, I'm just a set of steps for solving the problem, right? The person who's dumb is you if you use that algorithm to solve a problem when there's a faster algorithm, right? But a dumb algorithm will take a problem that, for example, is O n. Finding out whether an array is sorted is O n. And you guys can convince yourselves of that on the forum or offline. The algorithm that I showed you that is dumb, because I'm dumb for putting it on the slides, is O n squared. So I've taken a problem that should be solvable as it should be in the ON category, and I've created, I'm using an algorithm that's in ON squared, right? I'm dumb. I made a dumb choice of the algorithm to solve that problem. A smart algorithm, on the other hand, does the opposite, right? A smart algorithm picks an algorithm to solve the problem that is at least close to the optimal performance for solving that kind of problem. When we talk about various types of problems in this class, we'll talk about the bound. Right? Because again, if someone comes and tells you I can sort an array in O n, you should be like, no, no, no. No, you can't, right? We can prove, and you, I think you will prove later in a later course, that the best case runtime for an optimal sorting algorithm on a random input is O n log n. 
I can't get faster than that. I can get faster than that in certain special cases, but the best per case performance for a general unsorted array of random inputs is O n log n. But if you choose an algorithm to sort that's O n squared, that's dumb. If you choose an algorithm that's O log n, n log n, that's smart, right? So a, a smart algorithm, you know, takes you, you know, from here down to here. This is O n squared, this is O n log n. You can see there's a huge difference when the problem gets bigger, right? Like, this is going up here. We're gonna talk about sorting algorithms that are O n squared, right? They're, they're, they're going this direction, and then we'll talk about better sorting algorithms that are O n log n. Once you start to deal with even moderately sized inputs, this matters, even though computers are really fast. For our array sorted test, we did the opposite. We, we took a problem that should be growing very nice and linearly with the size of the inputs, and we jacked it all the way up to this ridiculous O n squared behavior, right? And, and again, we're gonna notice that once things get a little bit bigger. Okay. I, I, wanna, I wanna connect this, I'm gonna do two things before we're done. I'm gonna quickly connect this with a really beautiful piece of computer science theory, and then we're gonna talk about lists very quickly so that you guys can do today's homework problem. So the, the, probably the largest unsolved problem in computer science and the largest, probably one of the most uh, largest unsolved problems in mathematics, right, because this is a, a problem in an area where there's a lot of overlap between the two fields, is this question of whether or not, you know, we, we, you hear about this as whether P is equal to NP. But to try to explain this to a, to in, a, in a layman sense or in a, first course in computer science sense, the question is whether some problems are just fundamentally harder to solve than others. Right now we have a category of problems that we refer to as being in this class NP, where there is no known polynomial time algorithm to solve those problems. And these problems tend to be kind of important, right? There, there's also, interestingly, a lot of similarity between them. There are uh, proofs that if you can solve one of these problems in this class called NP, you can use that to solve all the other ones, right? So there's something coherent about this group of problems. You guys can look these up online. They're really, they're fascinating problems though, right? They have real world implications. So far, we have not found an algorithm that can solve these problems in polynomial time. One of the characteristics of these problems that's interesting is that you can verify a solution very quickly. So these are problems for which it's uh, very quick to verify that a solution is correct, but it's very hard to produce the solution. So it turns out that if you generalize Sudoku, how many people here have played Sudoku before? So if you generalize Sudoku to large boards, right, so if you take Sudoku, and you run it on a board of like six by six or eight by eight, right, where each cell has more than the typical three items. Solving that board is in NP. That's an NP hard problem. The thing that you can notice about this, that's interesting, is that if I give you a solved Sudoku puzzle, it's very easy for you to verify that the solution is correct. You can do that in O N time, where N is the number of tiles. Right, you just have to scan through and make sure that everything adds up properly. So I can very quickly verify a solution. But if I give you, again, this is true for much larger boards, if I give you a large problem, uh, there's, there's no way to solve it in polynomial time. The problem uh, gets harder and harder much faster than the size of the input that I give. Right, so, so again, if this problem, you guys won't have to follow the, you know, some people are interested in this, you know, look it up, find out more about it, it's fascinating, right? But you will, you will hear about this if and when this problem is solved because it'll be on the front page of the New York Times, right, or whatever paper you read. This is such an important problem that if anybody ever manages to prove that this category of problems is fundamentally different from any, every other problem we've tried to solve, it will be huge news, right? That person will be super famous, they'll win a lot of money, um, we're, we're increasingly certain that this is the case because, remember, all we need to, to, to disprove it is an algorithm. If you find an algorithm that can solve all of those problems in MP and polynomial time, 
you'll also be really famous, right? Um, because we'll know that it's not true. But so far, decades have gone by, a lot of smart people have thought about this problem, but we don't have a counterexample. And so the computer science community is more and more certain that P and NP are two different classes of problem, but no one has been able to prove that that's true yet. That turns out to be hard. All right, I've got four minutes, so I'm gonna quickly do two things, right? The data structures that we're gonna start talking about operate on Java objects. This is a super annoying little interlude I have to do, right? Um, all Java objects implement things like equals and hash code. But then what do we do with these primitive types? Let's say I have a list and I want to insert integers into the list. Or I have a tree and I want to put integers or long values into my tree. Those primitive types are not objects. They don't have equals, they don't have hash code, they don't have these other methods that we need. So instead, what we do in Java is we use something called um, a, a wrapper class. So for every primitive type in Java, there is a wrapper. So this is uh, a way to, this is the wrapper for integer, for int, sorry. It's called integer. It's capitalized, it's the name of an object class. Um, I can cast a primitive value to its wrapper class directly. So this is a primitive int literal, and I'm casting it to a reference to a capital I integer. And I can also cast them back using the, the primitive types, okay? You're gonna just start to see these on our examples. Here's the entire table for your reference. Um, mo in most cases, the name is the same name of the primitive type capitalized. But that's not true in all of them. There's a couple of annoying exceptions. Integer is one, um, and character is the other. So again, here is the primitive type. Remember, we have seven of those. We have seven object wrapper types. An object of that type stores a value of the primitive type, but we can use it as part of our um, container data structures that we're gonna start talking about. Okay, we got floats as well. Yeah, really exciting. Okay, so today's homework problem, we've got two minutes, it's just enough time to do this, introduces you to a generalized data structure that's called a list. A list is a generalization of an array, but it's more flexible. It allows us to do things like just like an array, I can get and set values at any index. So this is a property that a list shares with an array, but unlike an array, I can add or remove things from my list, meaning that it can change size. I can add elements to the end, I can add them to the beginning, I can insert them in the middle. I can add anywhere in the list that I want. Lists are one of the most useful data structures in computer science. Most programming languages support them now you know, internally, Python has lists built into it that you can use without having to think about some of these things. Um, we're also gonna talk about maps, which are the other more useful data structure in computer science. We'll get to them in a couple of weeks, okay? So what we're gonna do, starting on Friday and then continuing the Monday after uh, spring break, is we're gonna build two different types of lists together. You're gonna do most of it on the homework, and then we're gonna talk about the results in class. Um, for lists, we're gonna use one way of implementing a list that uses an array internally to store the values, and we're gonna use a second way that uses a linked list. Both of these, I'm gonna come back and talk about this on Friday, don't worry. Both of these are gonna to conform to an interface that we are gonna use in this class that defines what a list is. So here's our list interface, and this is something that you guys are gonna start implementing today, continue tomorrow, um, and then come back to when you come back from break in two different ways. So our lists have to support get and set just like an array. I should be able to get the value from an index and set it. I also need to be able to support add and remove. So these are elements that either insert a new element into the array or remove it. Both of those are gonna change the size. I also have a size uh, function that I need to be able to support that tells how many elements are in the array. Okay, we'll come back and talk about this on Friday. Uh, good luck finishing up MP3. I will see you guys on Friday. <laughs>